and some of the things that were mentioned in the um, activist orientation guide, and there's also a lot of um, uh, preconceptions that people have uh, when they're first introduced to the concept of a resource-based economy, and uh, this causes a lot of frustration and confusion. Um, so this is this is sort of to um, to clear to clear that up. Um, so yes. Yes, if you want to uh, sort of understand the basis behind this, then uh, do check out the activist orientation guide, um, which you can get from the zeitgeistmovement.com. Right. So, our story starts in the second century when a chap called Ptolemy formulated a model of the solar system that attempted to describe the motion of the sun, the moon, and the planets. Up until that time, the main explanation for the motion of these bodies was given by Aristotle, which looked like this. Earth was placed at the center, with the planets orbiting in uniform concentric circles around it. At that time, it was simply taken for granted that Earth was at the center of the universe. But there was a problem with this, however. And Ptolemy observed that the planets, most notably Mars, had a peculiar retrograde motion that Aristotle's model couldn't account for. It threw into question the perfectly circular orbits that everybody had accepted. Yeah. <coughs> Ptolemy sought to correct this and introduced a series of adjustments known as deference and epicycles. These are essentially a series of circles within circles uh, that the planets were fixed to. The implication of this theory was that the planets now moved in complicated geocentric spirals around the Earth. But still, this was not enough to accurately predict the motion of the planets, and so more adjustments were made in order to correct the variation in the retrograde loops. <laughs> the model became increasingly, increasingly complicated, with equations piled upon equations in complex geometric spirals that baffled the mind. Despite initial resistance to Ptolemy's model and its flaws, the geocentric model would remain dominant for over 1,500 years, and it wasn't until the scientific revolution and the likes of Galileo, Copernicus, and Kepler. There we go. That I'll be calling into question. <laughs> I had a lot of fun with this. When the Sun was proposed as the center of the solar system, the endless circles of Ptolemy's model were no longer needed. Indeed, the motion of the planets can now be described with, uh, using only a handful of simple, elegant equations. Uh, this revelation sent, sent shockwaves around the world, and it wasn't long before the church began to denounce the heliocentric theory and their proponents as evil.
And hopefully, all of you aren't here today by choice. Uh, but free will represents something more than choice. It is a theory of the mind, and that theory has permeated throughout our society on many levels. The implications are far-reaching, for we have designed ideologies, practices, and entire institutions around this theory. The debate as to whether we have free will stretches back to the very beginning of philosophical thought. And after thousands of years, there are, broadly speaking, four positions on the matter. Uh, the key issue here is uh, determinism. A theory or doctrine that acts of will, occurrences in nature, or social or psychological phenomena are causally determined by preceding events or natural laws, or in the well, if, uh, words of Charles Darwin, uh, everything in nature is the result of fixed laws. If we consider the human brain, we find a collection of neurological tissue that processes information in different areas of the brain have different functions. Our neurons appear to respond to predictable fat patterns firing only when particular neurochemical conditions are present in the brain. If the electrical signals of our brain obey natural laws, can the same not be said of our will that our choices are not random but follow a very specific pattern? To illustrate this, imagine playing a game of darts. If we know the laws of motion that govern the flight path of the dart, along with the initial conditions of the launch, such as the velocity, uh, pitch, spin, lift, and drag of the dart, along with information about the volume of air the dart has travelled through, then we can predict where the dart will hit the ball. The more information we know about the preceding events, the more accurate our prediction becomes. Indeed, the very same application of knowledge has allowed us to develop uh, our technology by observing and reacting to predictable patterns using the scientific method. If we knew all the information about the dart's launch, along with a complete knowledge of physics, we would be able to calculate exactly where it would land. We would even engineer a dart such that it always hit the bullseye. Those behaviours that are constructive. 
as noted by the Active Observations and Responses Activist Orientation Guide, and its sources, it's clear that our environment has a huge role in determining our personality, from our behaviours to our preferences, and it shapes our lives in ways we cannot immediately perceive. For example, if you were raised in a family of a particular religious faith, in all probability, you would adopt and identify with that religion later on in life. Of course, this is all dependent on your level of exposure to ideas and information. If you are exposed to many different cultures throughout your life, or are encouraged to investigate other points of view, or both, then it becomes less certain which religion or faith you will identify with, if indeed you do at all. <laughs> In a similar way, our socioeconomic class, what kind of people we associate with, our level of education and so on, all feed into the pot, as it were. Numerous studies in behavioural science and sociology have shown a powerful connection between our environment and our health and behaviours. So, let's put this into a bit of a perspective and clear things up. We'll have a case study. If we look back over the last century, we find some striking examples of how human behaviour and decision making has been strongly influenced by our environment. Edward Bernays was an American propagandist that supported and advised President Woodrow Wilson during the First World War and was also the nephew of psychoanalyst Sigmund Freud. Freud was convinced that human beings were susceptible to unconscious and irrational forces and articulated this theory in his book A General Introduction to Psychoanalysis. Bernays read his uncle's work and was inspired. He believed, he believed that if you could use propaganda for war, then you could certainly use it for peace. He established an office in Manhattan, New York, to promote this, and entitled it the Council on Public Relations. In the 1920s, he was approached by the American Tobacco Company to help advertise cigarettes to women. At that time, there was a taboo against women smoking in public, as cigarettes were fundamentally seen as a symbol of manhood. Bernays believed he could remove the taboo by appealing to the unconscious desires of the masses. And to do this, he helped, uh, he, was, he solicited the help of American psychoanalyst Dr. A.A. A. Brill. Dr. Brill told Bernays that cigarettes could symbolize liberty and independence for women, and that encouraging women to smoke would be seen as a sign of equality, freeing them from a form of discrimination. With this idea, Bernays planned a demonstration for the 1929 Easter Day Parade in New York City. He instructed debutantes to march in the parade with cigarettes concealed under their clothing. When given the signal by Bernays, they were to remove the cigarettes and light them up dramatically. The display drew the attention of the crowds and the press. The debutantes claimed they were protesting male dominance by lighting up what they called torches of freedom, and the story spread across the United States and around the world. Bernays' legendary publicity stunt had influenced the masses and eroded the stigma of the time. It was no longer inappropriate for women to smoke in public. Cigarette sales for women rose sharply. Theatres, restaurants, and other establishments changed their policy so women could now smoke on their premises. For Bernays, it was triumphant success, and it made him one of the most powerful and influential men in America. Public relations transformed uh, American industry and had a profound effect on the economy. In post-war America, corporations were afraid of overproduction, that supply would outstrip demand, and no one would be able to buy the excess of goods being turned out by new manufacturing processes. Until the 1920s, products were advertised in strictly functional terms, attempting to persuade people by appealing to their rationale. Simultaneously, the American people at large only bought what they needed, and very little uh, luxury goods were purchased outside of the upper classes. But he took it upon himself and his associates to transform the mindset of the public from that of needs to one of desires. Using his uncle Freud's work, he would again appeal to the unconscious feelings of the masses. Products were now advertised with emotional connections, and people began to buy things they didn't need, but wanted. Paul Mazur, a Wall Street banker of Lehman Brothers, wrote in the 1930s, We must shift America from a, a needs to a desires culture. People must be trained to desire to want new things, even before the old have been entirely consumed. Man's desires must overshadow his needs. Edward Bernays continued to expand the profession of public relations and frequently wrote about his theories and accomplishments. The techniques Bernays employed would later be used in the 1930s 
by the Nazi party to mold the attitudes and perspectives of the German people. Joseph Goebbels was the foremost supporter of this idea and became the Nazi's minister for propaganda. As his inspiration, Goebbels cited a book by Manet's on proud psychology. In the 1950s, during the Cold War, Benes would be called upon by the CIA to launch a public relations campaign to convince the American public that Colonel Arbenz of Guatemala, who had become president in 1951, was a ruthless communist dictator. In reality, Arbenz was a democratic socialist with no connections to Stalin or Moscow. Arbenz had promised the American people, uh, sorry, the Guatemalan people, uh, that he would work in order to reform land rights and ensure that the country's resources were used to benefit the people. The policies Arbenz promoted proved to be disastrous for United Fruit, an American corporation operating in Guatemala at that time. Bernays launched a tirade against Arbenz, producing falsified news reports, persuading influential journalists to write reports critical of Arbenz's administration, and even staging mock anti-American protests in Guatemala. The American public was outraged and insisted the government intervene. This gave the CIA and United Fruit the perfect opportunity. Agents in Guatemala trained rebel army, staged a coup, and removed Arvid from power. After the president was gone, a new administration was brought in that was sympathetic to the needs of American business. Public relations have been largely responsible for modern advertising techniques. And these shape our world in ways we cannot fathom. We are bombarded every single day by messages, advertisements, commercials that tell us what to buy, how to act, and how to think. Experts in ancient Greek culture say that people back then didn't see their thoughts as belonging to them. When ancient Greeks had a thought, it occurred to them as a god or goddess giving them an order. Apollo was telling them to be brave, Athena was telling them to fall in love. Now people hear a, sour, a commercial for sour cream potato chips and rush out to buy, but they, now they call this free will. <laughs> At least the ancient Greeks were being honest. <laughs> okay, so our second case study. Fast forward to 1961, Yale University. University. Psychologist Stanley Milgram thought of a series of experiments to test the connection between authority and... Oh. There we are. Yeah. <laughs> to test the connection between authority and obedience. Milgram was fascinated by the Second World War, particularly how many had been seemingly complacent with the Nazi regime and had willingly carried out the pl plethora of atrocities committed. Milgram quietly put an advertisement in newspapers, asking for volunteers for a study on memory and learning. The participants arrived at the laboratory and took slips of paper to determine their role in the experiment, teacher or learner. However, it was impossible for the volunteers to choose learner, as the, all the slips read teacher. The learner would instead be played by an actor. This was staged so that all the participants would be teachers, enabling Milgram to conduct the real con uh, experiment on obedience. The teacher and the dummy learner were then separated. They were placed in different rooms where they could hear each other, but not see each other. The experimenter was in the same room as the teacher and instructed them on what to do. At the start, the teacher was given a small electric shock and was told that the same shock would be applied to the... Let's skip that There we go. Uh, it was given a small electric shock and told that the same shock would be applied to the uh, learner if they answered questions incorrectly. The teacher would then be given a list of word pairs and gambling them to the learner. The teacher would then read the first word of each pair and read four possible answers. The, leader would press a button to, uh, the learner would press a button to indicate his response. If the answer was incorrect, uh, the teacher would administer a shock. If the answer was correct, they would move on to the next set of questions. However, uh, there was one important element in this. For every successive answer the learner got wrong, the voltage of the shot would be increased by 15 volts. Um, and the, as the voltage increased, screams of pain would be heard through the internet. In reality, no shots were administered. These screams were pre-recorded and put on a tape recorder that the actor brought in with them. 
and they will play when they give them the appropriate signal. To the participants, however, it appeared that they were inflicting terrible electrical shocks on fellow volunteers. At 135 volts, many stopped to question the experiment. They expressed concern for the learner and asked the experimenter if they should stop and check on them. Most continued when they were sure that they would not be held responsible. <laughs> Gradually, the screams would get worse, and the actor would bang on the screen that separated them, begging for the shocks to stop. Eventually, after a certain voltage, there would be no response. No answers, no banging, no screams. The stress of the situation began to grate on the subject, and they asked the experimenter to stop the test. If the subject still wanted to stop after four commands, then the experiment was halted. Otherwise, the experimenter would continue until the teacher administered the maximum voltage of 450 volts. Uh, these are particular phrases that the experimenter used to uh, I just command, please continue, so on and so forth. A maximum voltage of 450 volts. This was administered three times before the experiment was ended. Just to put that in perspective, 450 volts is nearly twice the UK mains voltage, and this is being applied to people. Well, that's what they think. Now, before Milgram quizzed, uh, before the study, Milgram quizzed several senior year psychology students at Yale University and asked them what percentage of the population would be able and willing to go all the way to 450 volts and do it three times. Milgram got a response of about 1%. 1% of people with sadistic tendencies. Milgram then asked his colleagues, fellow professor, professors, etc., what they would think, and he got a similar response, 1%. Now, let's see what you think. We'll break this down by percentages and have our hands up folks. So, um, hold on just a minute. So, these are the percentages. Pick which one you want to have, um, and so on. So, who thinks nobody did it? Nobody went to 450 volts? Any Gandhis in the audience? <laughs> no, some realism. Okay. Zero to 10%. So, this encapsulates the 1% recommendation by psychologists. I see a few hands dotted around. Okay, 10 to 25% are medium hands. Get some more hands. 25 to 50%. Okay, more, more hands. 50 to 75%. Okay, quite a few people there. 75 to 90s. You bloody pessimists. <laughs> and for the Satanist Samoas, 94%. A smattering of hands. Okay, well, 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 let's see. What was the real, real figure? and did it three times. Just to put that in perspective, 65% of this room is 700 people. 700 people willing to go to that voltage. And this isn't just an isolated study, by the way. It's been repeated over and over and over again. When Milgram later published a book detailing the results of the stu uh, study, he described 19 variations of the experiment. The main variable in this was the proximity between the uh, experimenter and the learner and the teacher. If the teacher was closer to the learner, i.e. could see the learner, then obedience would drop. However, if the learner was closer to the experimenter or further away from the teacher, i.e. the intercom was only one way so they couldn't hear the screams or the banging, uh, then obedience would rise. Perhaps the most revealing variation of the inclusion was the inclusion of another second teacher played by a second actor. The actor would be instructed either to follow the procedure as an experimenter, describe, as the experimenter described, or to deliberately oppose the procedure. In the cases where the actor opposed the procedure, compliance dropped to a mere 10%. Only 10% of people went all the way. However, in the cases where the actor followed the procedure, the level of compliance shot up. Ninety-three percent. 
We are profoundly affected by our environment. Our decisions are made largely based not on rationale, but the circumstances under which we make them, and our disposition at the time, uh, which are determined by values, which in turn are acquired through our culture. In short, we are all victims of culture. So, what does all this mean? What's the problem? The problem is that our entire socio-economic system is based on the assumption of free will as previously described. Democracy, for example, is contingent upon people making reliable judgments about the type of government they want to see. If people's choices could be influenced, then those in positions of power are not really representing the interests of people. Free market capitalism is another example, where management of resources is based not on a method of methodology of efficiency, but an ideology of free will, that by everyone acting in their own self-interest will get a society that is humane and mutually beneficial somehow. But it is erroneous to base an entire system on such a theory. Even Edward Bernays, Ed, sorry, Edward Bernays, who was a chief proponent of both democracy and capitalism, unwittingly the basic idea in his 1928 book Propaganda Writing. It's a long one. The conscious and intelligent manipulation of the organized habits and opinions of the masses is an important element in democratic society. Those who manipulate this unseen mechanism of society constitute an invisible government, which is the true ruling power of our country. We are governed. Our minds are molded, our tastes formed, our ideas suggested, largely by men we have never heard of. This is a logical result of the way in which our democratic society is organized. Vast numbers of humans must cooperate in this manner if they are to live together as a smoothly functioning society. In almost every act of our daily lives, whether in the sphere of politics or business, in our social conduct or our ethical thinking, we are dominated by the relatively small number of persons who understand the mental processes and social patterns of the masses. It is they who pull the wires which control the public mind. It is at this point that we introduce an alternative, a resource-based economy. It is a socio-economic system which takes into account the resources of the earth with the aim of creating a society of abundance where goods and services will be freely available. Simultaneously, our social instru institutions would change with a new emphasis on humanistic values. And there would be an encouraged uh, awareness of our interrelationship between our environment and our health and behaviors. What the? <laughs> this slide will keep the job in the head. There we are. In this system, decisions will not be made but arrive at. Many who hear this for the first time do not grasp the implications of this statement. If we understand that all, our problem, all of our problems are fundamentally technical, then there is a logical progression in order to solve them. In building a bridge is, in principle, no different than solving a mathematical equation. We, are, we simply need to account for all the variables stated, uh, stated before. The more information we have, we have, the better our solutions. Humans are not removed from this process of decision making, but the way the process is conducted is entirely different. The crucial element to understand in this is that opinion has no weight, and the results are not subject to interpretation. For example, if you handed the blueprints to an engineer in Japan, they will be able to reproduce the bridge exactly as you designed it. Furthermore, many decisions uh, in our, that are made in society today often revolve around the management of money, budgets, that sort of thing. But when we take a step back, we see that the vast majority of the political establishment is composed of little more than managers, accountants, and secretaries. In a post-scarcity society, such as a resource-based economy, there will be no money. And so politicians and politics at large, as we see them today, would have little to no practical, fun uh, practical function. Now, it's important to emphasize the distinction between societal decisions, such as the uh, placement of a geothermal power station, and individual 